Good afternoon, everybody. While we uh, get everybody settled in, I want to let you in on a little secret, all of you who have come here early. If you're sitting next to handouts, you're also sitting next to an evaluation form that has a little space for you to put your name in and tear off for the prize drawing at the end. So sit next to one of those. They're closer to the front. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. If you're not aware of it, there's free cake in the back. So help yourself to that free coffee and if you are active on social media tell your friends and tell them that there's free pizza at three o'clock i mean come up we can get it so i want to get this uh, second half of the event started we have two great individuals here today dr tofel and dr tom tobin and they're going to be talking about universal design for learning and how we can change the environment to make it accessible for anyone including the classroom but before we get started uh the president, Dr. Sharon Hart, would like to say a few words before we continue. Come on up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. You're almost ready for a good session. Apparently, you had a wonderful morning session, so I want to cheer you on. So let's do it one more time. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay, now you are really ready. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, welcome to the afternoon session. It is entitled Universal Design for Learning, a Bold Pedagogical Approach. Universal Design for Learning, I think they're going to be calling it UDL. So UDL here and UDL there. But that is new for me as well, and I'm excited that we are all going to be learning about that. UDL is a concept that makes Northeastern's classrooms and delivery of instruction accessible to all learners. So it isn't just a specialized piece, it is excellent for all learners. So it's not just those with disabilities, we have many bilingual learners, uh, first generation learners, multicultural learners, international students, and over 400 students who have self-identified as students with disabilities. Utilizing the UDL approach has a huge potential to bolster our retention rates and attract students to our campuses because we recognize not only the diversity of our student population, but the diversity of our learning styles. And I think that is critically important. I came out of the sciences and we all learned science differently. We all had to master it in the end. So learning styles really are an important component for us. But most especially, I think, personally, and for our university, this is a wonderful day for Northeastern. With your conference, with this good work, this powerful approach, we are celebrating our university values. Now, I won't give you the quiz. There are six, but I will run down them for you and give the quick description because I think this is really important to us. Integrity. It speaks of being committed to honesty and respect in all of our actions. And we reflect great respect when we welcome all learners. Excellence. We say that we value the highest quality of learning and teaching, scholarship, and service. The UDL can be a part of this quality. Access to opportunity. We value a welcoming environment that provides appropriate support as well as encourages mutual responsibility for and commitment to learning. Diversity. This one I think speaks to us already, but we value the inclusion of a broad spectrum of students, staff, and faculty in the life of our university. Community. We have a special obligation to provide an environment that is supportive, nurturing, and participatory. Our sixth value is empowerment through learning. We are committed to transforming students' lives by engaging them in an educational experience that empowers them to graduate with skills and knowledge to become effective leaders and citizens in their personal and professional lives. So I think you can see how our values inform what we are doing today. So I want to commend you all. I want to commend you for your commitment, for your planning, and for your participation in this important work. And this important work is supported by our university values, and this important work supports student learning. So I wish you a productive session this afternoon, and thank you all for participating. So thanks so much.
Thank you, Dr. Hyde. Now, without further ado, uh, Dr. Tom Tobin and Dr. Chris Topher. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom. And, uh, I'm Chris. Hello, hello. And uh, while we're getting set up here, I want to uh, mention a little bit of housekeeping. If you haven't uh, heard the news, where you folks are sitting right now, if you see an evaluation form near you, there's a side to it that says, please sign your name here. That seems weird until you realize that you sign your name there, you fold it over and tear it off, and you put it in this special conference bucket, and you're in the drawing for the prize at the end. So if you want to take a couple seconds to put your name on that slip of paper, we'll get set up up here. I want to put a slide up here to uh, just get us started. Uh, we're talking a little bit today about universal design for learning. It's a way to put together learning experiences so that everybody benefits, not just students with disabilities. This is a conference uh, about uh, reaching out to people with disabilities, and I'm about to, with Dr. Toffolo, share a presentation with you. It's going to be interactive, and it's also not about people with disabilities. So please bear with me. Um, I want to read what's up here on the screen. It says, warning, this presentation contains PowerPoint, just in case you didn't know. Uh, slides will contain more than seven lines of text, more than seven words per line. And uh, images displayed may or may not pertain directly to whatever is being said. Persons under the age of 14 and those with heart conditions must keep hands and feet inside the ride at all times. In case of a water landing or boredom, remember that the nearest exit may be behind you. Aisle lights will illuminate to indicate when it's safe to remove the pizza from the microwave. Contents are extremely hot. Seek immediate medical advice if you experience universal design learning knowledge lasting more than four hours. Use caution when applying these universal design for learning principles at your own institution. So with that, let me switch over to our opening slide here. And I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Christoflo. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm the untechnological one here, so I have a different style of presenting. This is Tom's beautiful PowerPoint. But he assured me that um, I wouldn't need to. So uh, I'm Chris Tuffle. I'm chair of the Justice Studies Department. And you know, just by the very nature of our department, we do a lot of work um, on uh, you know, overcoming racism and sexism and a lot of different things. So I kind of felt like um, we didn't have any problems, we didn't have any challenges, we knew what we were doing, it was all okay. And then uh, in the last presidential election cycle, I thought I was being very hip and cool and participating in democracy by telling my students, um, I'll give you extra credit uh, if you vote and show me evidence of having voted. And that's when I realized the limits of my awareness because my undocumented students in the class quietly came up to me at the end of the class and said, well, we can't get extra credit. Will you give us another assignment? And I was like, right, this is Northeastern, dumb me, right? So that got me to go and attend the undocumented student training, which I was very grateful took place here on campus. And as a result of that, um, I learned a lot about the experiences of our undocumented students and immediately went back to our department. And one of the easy changes that we were able to make, uh, which has made a big difference in their lives and some other students, is um, we have an internship list. We have about 90 different um, sites on our internship list that we hand out to students when they're going to fill their very last course requirement, which is to do an internship. But well, we've added two columns. One says, must you be a U.S. citizen or green card holder to apply for this position? So all the undocumented students now don't have to try and figure that out for themselves. And the other column we added just while we were thinking about it is, will this internship require a background check? for students who may have a prior record or any other reason that they might not want to have a background check. So um, it was just kind of thinking about one thing, we kind of added the other thing. So uh, that was so easy to do. It just added, I mean, adding two columns to something we already had set up and all of a sudden, certainly one group of students, perhaps two groups of students in our department are now better served by that. And I think that's the message that I want to take away is that it's like in the process of just being a little bit aware, you can just make tiny changes that have large impacts um, on the student body. And I will give you now an example um, in terms of we know we have a lot of students who are struggling to make ends meet to, in order to afford their college education. So one of the things that our department has done, and I think this is happening increasingly throughout the college, is that we're finding ways to deliver content without having students buying $100 textbooks. Um, it means 
means putting content online, it means changing content a lot, but that also has other benefits because it keeps your cur courses current. Um, so without going around copyright law, um, there's a lot of ways to deliver content for free, increasingly so. So keeping the cost of education down is now a commitment in our department. And likewise, um, you know, it was faculty in my department who um, started telling me stories about the fact that the students were making a choice between buying textbooks and eating. And when we started collecting those stories, we brought them forward and we found out that people were hearing that across the campus and a group of us, not just faculty, but many people in student affairs and in TRIO, and I'm seeing some faces out there, some allies, um, we started thinking creatively about the way that we could help. Um, TRIO really responded by occasionally just having some food available in not a big flashy way. Um, we talked with the sororities and fraternities on campus about giving away fresh fruit last year. Um, we're still trying to get the food bank up and running and we've started the gardening project. So I think we're starting to see that as social services close down around the city and around the country that our institution has to take on unfortunately more and more of those tasks. But if we want students to stay in school and be able to focus on their education, it's necessary to do. So that was, again, it's not a huge outlay of money. If we all pitch in a little bit, but we're finding ways to help students lower the cost of books, but also find ways to get healthy food. Uh, and that was really brought home to me when we had some leftover food at an event and we invited students to come in and we had salad, spaghetti, and cookies. They came in and rushed the salad and the spaghetti and left the cookies. Those are hungry students. Those aren't students who are just grazing around for extra, extra calories. Um, the thing I handed out, and I apologize, I didn't have enough handouts for the whole group, um, but we have them. And the reason I'm, it was this yellow sheet. This is the sheet that I give, it's the intake sheet for all students when they come to our department as majors or minors, and I walk them through that sheet. And I don't assume any knowledge, so the first part is like literally, you know, things like, you know, how do you get online and find your class? Um, and I explain that, that even we have three campuses and what those assign, you know, how, how do you know course has a, goes to which campus? But what I really was handing it out for is there's a bottom section called getting help. And we've put together all of the different services at the university and we hand this out and I walk through them with each one of our new students um, for all the different kinds of help that they might need. And basically I premise that by saying, now that you're here we know you have what it takes to graduate, but we also know that most students have at least one difficult semester, um, so that's normal and here are the various help services that are available and you need to let us know because if you let us know, we'll reach out and meet you halfway. And in particular, around the stigma associated with mental illness, I often kind of in one breath say we have both physical and mental health services. So if you've got a cold or need a flu shot or you're feeling stressed or depressed, go see some of those folks. So I try to destigmatize the mental illness in the way I present that material. Um, switching a little bit, uh, another way in which we've tried to make our program more accessible and more friendly for all students is a variety of ways of delivering content that's not so time bounded. So obviously moving to online courses is one part of that. Um, in my own course, I've moved away from midterm and final exams and I give a series of things I call FEQs, free, uh, final exam questions. And the students know that every week there's two questions, final exam questions. They're the same level of difficulty that would be on a final exam. They choose one of them and write on it, and they choose their own schedule. I tend to make two of them, they are scheduled at a particular time, but the students have plenty of awareness, and then the other four exam questions, the students choose. So they choose which content they want to learn the most deeply, and or they choose what fits into their schedule given their busy lives with work and family responsibilities. So it makes, a, you know, there's different ways you can go through my course and still be successful depending on your interest and your time commitments. The other th another thing that's really easy to do is just after you make the schedule, chairs in the audience, is you double check to make sure that you're doing tight scheduling. So our two required courses that we tell students they should take in the same semester, I always make sure that we, we do them in a block. There's a daytime block, there's an evening block, so that if, if nothing else, they can get those two classes and come to campus once and say, cut down on their driving time. Um, the other, finally the last, uh, well there's two other things. One is we also have special 
courses designed for special groups of our students. And perhaps the one uh, that we're most proud of in our most recent edition is a course on social justice and mental health. And that was really in response to a faculty member who's a lawyer who began to see all the public mental health services disappearing around the city about two years ago. And she designed a course after hearing many, many, many of our students need those services and their own education is being disrupted. So now we have a course which teaches um, people about their rights with respect to mental illness, but also about the larger issues. And then last, um, I'm dyslexic. I'm a terrible speller. I self-disclose this every chance I get, especially in my classroom, and it's kind of a joke with my students. It's like some days I can spell and some days I can't. And some days I have, you know, I, teach, I teach political theory, so I have big words, and some days, you know, phenomenology, and I just don't, don't go. <laughs> Don't, don't go together, and I and I do that on t intentionally, um, and it's led me to ha end up getting several students at this institution tested. Um, one student came in crying because she didn't think she was college material. She ended up getting straight A's here, and um, is going on to do wonderful work in the world. But it was because we finally talked about the fact that she had um, an undiagnosed learning disability. She got tested in her first semester here, and then had as a successful a career you can have at this school. So I try to make that clear that intelligence and uh, your learning style have nothing to do with one another. Um, and you know, it, and it, gives a ch it also makes me more human for the students, um, especially if you're a theory teacher, you're totally scary. So if I can get up on the board and not spell cat, my students really like it. So it's another way of just decreasing that, that status level between groups, um, which I think also lowers the fear, which allows for more learning. So I'm here just to kind of give the examples. Tom's the brains of the operation, so I'm going to turn it back over to him. Thank you, Kristen. Give Chris a hand. Uh, what you heard Dr. Toffolo talking about wasn't accommodating students with disabilities. And that's when I said when we started off that this is not going to be a presentation about accommodating students with disabilities. Universal design for learning is something much broader than simply accommodation. And I'll talk about that in a second. But think about what you heard Dr. Toffolo just say. We wanted to remove barriers for our students so that they could learn better. We wanted to remove barriers for students who couldn't buy a textbook. We wanted to remove barriers for students who needed a, a snack or some food or a meal. We wanted to remove barriers for students who were time crunched. How many of you students have lots of free time? You're all working, you have families, come on. So what I want to share with you now and I want to make this sort of a three-part, three-audience presentation. How many faculty members do we have in the audience here today? All right, we've got six or seven of you folks. OK. The next piece, how many people here are students or otherwise connected with the university? A bunch. OK, cool. And we have some community visitors. We've got to have a couple of you guys. All right, awesome. Now, all of you will have something to take away from this session. Now, all you faculty, close your ears for a moment. I want to talk to you students. The things we're going to talk about today, all the faculty members who are not here today, this is what you can ask them. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you making it easier for me to get my education? OK, faculty, start listening again. So. I'd like to introduce a completely fictional, made-up person. Uh, his name is Read More Books. The image up here is of a generic professor in front of a generic blackboard. And uh, he teaches detective fiction. And up on the screen now, there's a bunch of books in a bookstore with an outline like someone's been murdered. So in your minds, start thinking now about 1940s film noir, The Thin Man, The Maltese Falcon. Guys in fedoras, smoking cigarettes. Yes, I know, it was back then. Um, you know, hard-boiled detectives solving murders, right? Keep that in your mind as we go through our time today. Now, this is what Reed wants his students to do. It's a student under the covers with a bunch of graphic novels and 1940s noir, reading, 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 because the student is so engrossed and has brought all that information home, and the student is, is really engaged with the material. This is what the professor wants his students to do. This is what his students end up doing. Here we have a student on the bus reading the novel on his Kindle on the 3G wireless that he gets as he passes by public institutions. So we're all pressed for time. We have family responsibilities. We have work responsibilities. You know, it's few and far between that a student today 
has the luxury of just being a full-time student. So between what the professor wants the students to do and what the students actually end up doing most of the time, and I see a few people going, yeah, I, I, I look on the bus too. Reed is, like Professor Toffolo talked about, recasting his course for mobile learners. One of the big changes in learning these days, and I'd love to see a show. How many of you folks have looked at course materials on your mobile device? Almost everybody. Faculty in the room, pay attention to this. We are designing, typically, our learning support materials, syllabi, lectures, PowerPoint presentations, all those materials, we're designing them as though it's 1989 and all of our students have a PC. Our students are trying to get access, and all of you folks who are nodding along, they're getting access on their mobile phones. You try reading a PDF on a mobile phone, right? You, you guys are laughing because you've tried it, right? You scroll this way and that way because it doesn't resize. So one of the big challenges is how do we reach out? How can your faculty members reach out and help you to study when you're on the bus? Help you to study after you've put the kids to bed? Help you to find time in the day for studying that otherwise you wouldn't have been able to use for studying? Well, there is a nightmare that a lot of professors have, and this nightmare looks like this. This is a computer with two screens, and on each screen there are several windows Every single window has something going on. Uh, this faculty member is in a uh, real-time chat with it looks like 18 different people, and there's a text chat going on, and there's also a video that's happening, and you know the, the professor always has to be on. A lot of professors fear that if they're using technology in their courses, they're going to have to be the cyber professor, that this person is always on, always available, Students will email me at 11 o'clock at night, and I'm obliged to email them back. All you students who've emailed me at 11 o'clock at night, pay attention to this. It doesn't have to be the always-on professor. In fact, setting some expectations and using the design principles of Universal Design for Learning, UDL, this is what you students can expect your professors to use. This is what you support staffers can implement when you're thinking about your web design and your communication with students. And this is what you faculty members can implement in your classroom. So let's do a little thought exercise real quick here. And we have a microphone uh, up here. I hope it's turned on. And if it's not, we'll figure out how to do that. How could our friend read more books, connect to students who are on mobile devices? Just think of one strategy that that professor could use to supplement or maybe even replace a part of that face-to-face -face teaching. Think about it. Okay, so the, the comment is you could, uh, the professor could link to a website, there we go, that, that has content. Uh, for the students, good suggestion. Somebody else? You guys know this. Yeah. Thank you. I have a specific um, application for this. A teacher, they could course, like get a, get a course app for their phone. They could set up something like that. So the professor could put a, an app on the phone that would make it accessible for lots of different people. Awesome suggestion. Thank you. Yes. Other suggestions? Hassan? Maybe like videotape something and send it over. Uh, put it on YouTube or something like that or a website that can be reached. Yeah. Okay. How many of you folks have seen your professors uh, actually talk about what they're talking about on YouTube or some other video? A couple of few people. Okay, cool. Other ideas here? Robert in the back, coming to you with a microphone. There you go. Well, like, you know, if you have, you know, and this goes along with it, like, you know, blind, low vision, make sure that it's in an accessible format that people like that can use their screen readers and everything else to uh, uh, utilize the text. Fantastic, thank you. So that suggestion is one that we're going to cover, actually. So um, I didn't pay Robert to be here, but this is awesome. <laughs> Couple more. 
this side of the room is not very well represented. I need more ideas over here. I haven't heard anyone say desire to learn or you know a, a learning interface, but that can re replace some of the face-to-face -face teaching in different ways, in a variety of ways. Awesome. So putting content in a place where everybody has access to it, but it's secure, so people have to use a login. Why would you say if I say that I am against replacing face-to-face -face teaching? I would say come to the next session. <laughs> All right. Awesome. No, I, it, it, I am also against replacing face-to-face -face teaching. Um, and Wilfredo, you, you give me a really good segue into what we're going to talk about here. If I had my wish, I would teach nothing but face-to-face -face classes. It's immediate. I get voice tone, eye contact, body language. There's interaction with all of my students. Why would I do any any other way? The reason I would do it any other way is that face-to-face -face classes leave out students who don't communicate in the same way that I do. Face-to-face -face classes leave out those students who can't come to campus at the time I'm teaching that class. Face-to-face -face classes leave out those students who have work and family responsibilities. So if I'm able to reach out and either supplement my face-to-face -face classes in a way that makes it easier for people to learn and, and, and get information, or if I move into a blended class or even an online class, those are ways that I can reach out to people. Here's the secret. Doing that takes more work. Before you all get up and leave, that more work is absolutely worth it. You do a little bit now, and you save yourself and your students, if you're a faculty member, a lot of fuss later on. So let's actually help read out. Thank you very much for, for uh, bringing those suggestions. They're all really good ones, and we're going to talk about a few of them specifically. So universal design for learning really has three main elements. And on the screen, there's a bunch of uh, detective comic book covers from the 1940s. Uh, let's see, here we have uh, Dan Taylor, boy detective, battles the vice lords of crime. And there's a, the boy detective protecting a very shapely woman. And uh, let's see, this is Johnny Dynamite, criminals on the run, Sam Hill, private eye. And so remember, we're going to think about this detective fiction course that Reed is teaching. But universal design for learning has three things that really help learners no matter who they are. Multiple means of learner engagement. In other words, how do you keep students enthused about learning? How do you keep them moving through the material? You've probably seen course material that is presentation only. Here's a bunch of information, here's a bunch of information, here's a bunch of information. By the way, it's on the test. Okay, so one person laughed at that, good. So keeping people engaged, how do you make it so that people actually have to take a few actions as the process goes along? We're actually doing that right now. We stopped, we took some comments, we had some conversation. Multiple means of representing information. Um, we heard some of the comments saying, why not use an accessible format for your text documents? Why not create some videos? Why not give things out in multiple ways so that the people who want to watch the video, the people who want to hear the audio, the people who want to read the text can do so. This is extra work for faculty members? Maybe not, actually, and I'll show you how to do that in a couple seconds. You students, bug your professors to do this. This is the easy part. And multiple ways for learners to take action. You heard in uh, Christofolo's story about her final exam questions, the FEQs. Instead of saying, here is the final exam, here's the day on which it takes place, and here are the two questions that you must answer, she allows her students to have a choice. What pieces of this justice class are you most interested in learning more about or demonstrating your skill in? So she gives them a choice. They can write on this question, this question, pick two, pick three, whatever it is, out of six or seven questions. The other thing in terms of choice for learners is if you tell students Hey, here's a, an assignment. You can do this in a number of different ways. It's going to be more successful. And we'll talk about that in a couple of seconds. So on this slide, uh, we saw a, uh, a proud graduating senior in his cap and gown, uh, guys in a, uh, a motorized chair, and there's his proud dad smiling for the, the picture. This is the wait a minute moment. 
I thought that this universal design thing was just for learners with disabilities. What gives? Well, universal design for learning equals accessibility no matter why. This is why this is not a presentation about accommodating people with disabilities. Whether the barrier that's in front of people is I have a physical disability, I have a learning disability, or whether it's I only have a phone and I don't have a PC at home. Those are barriers no matter why. And so if we can design learning so that it brings those barriers down, we have just reached out to an awful lot of people. And we, uh, the image on the screen is a student on the steps of a building checking in on his phone late at night. In November of last year, I talked with Sam Johnston. She is a research scientist at CAST, the Center for Applied Special Technology in Boston. And uh, CAST is primarily concerned with helping people with disabilities. But what she said uh, in part of that conversation really rang true with me. And I want to share this with you here on the screen. Sam said, we want a situation that is good for everybody. Part of it is thinking about what has to happen at the level of design that makes accommodation less necessary. Let me talk about accommodation versus design. Accommodation means that we make some change based on a situation that presents itself to us. So if I'm a faculty member and a student comes up to me and the student says, I have a hearing disability. Um, I need a text version of your lecture notes and I need to have a sign language interpreter in my classroom. Well, I can make my changes based on what that student has just told me. That's accommodation. That's case by case. That's a lot of work. And it takes people by surprise because you don't know it's, that that request is coming necessarily. Design means that if I'm following these universal design principles, and I'll show them to you in the next couple of slides, if I'm following these universal design for learning principles, then I'm already designing my materials so that student with a hearing disability is just one of my students and does, may not even need to request that specific accommodation. So let's talk about what this means. And let's work along with Reed. Um, Reed is going to make a video. Uh, we had a, a suggestion here, why don't we you know, ask the professor to put his content onto YouTube and maybe caption it for his students. And Reed's going to do that video for one of his units on hard-boiled fiction. And so uh, remember, fedora, cigarette, shapely ladies, cocktails, murder, that kind of stuff. OK. Here are the five things that faculty members and staff members can do to apply universal design for learning in your classes and here on campus. First thing is start with text. I hope that most of these strategies are things that some of you are already doing, actually. This should not be news, but it should be a new way to think it through and put it in a package. So starting with text, if you're considering what do you usually say in a lecture? What do you usually talk to all of your students who come to your office about? That turns into an FAQ, a frequently asked questions on your website if you're a student support area. That can turn into a set of sketched out lecture notes. Um, it says on my, on my uh, tag here, coordinator of learning technologies, but this is how I draft all of my lectures. Quarter sheets of paper. My handwriting is really small, and I'm really old school that way. And then I transcribe this into a Microsoft Word document. There was a comment earlier, use accessible forms of things. If you're using Microsoft Word to create things, use the automatic heading section, or excuse me, feature of Microsoft Word, and then a screen reader will be able to read it for students with visual disabilities. How many of us do that? Almost none of us, because it means that you're actually accepting what Bill Gates put in there for you. And people don't like to do that, but in this case, he's actually doing us a favor. Second strategy is make alternatives. People often think that universal design for learning means that if I have a video, I have to caption the video, and I have to make a text version of it, and I have to make an audio-only version of it. No. As long as the content is accessible in more than one way, you are following universal design for learning principles. So for example, on the screen, we have some students who are taking a video of a professor who is sitting in a chemistry lab. The professor is sitting at her computer. And uh, up on the screen, the person with the video camera, there's a still camera next to the video camera to indicate that of that video, we can create still images. 
and those still images can help convey meaning if somebody who uh, if somebody has a, a visual disability that makes it difficult to follow motion. We have a student who is putting a thumbs up because he's pointing at the professor's computer screen and there's also a little piece of text down here in the corner to indicate that what the professor was working on as she was uh, speaking to the students and she was working on her computer, we can save that as a text file. And so it's easy to create alternative versions right there as you're creating the multimedia things as well. So that's the second strategy. So first strategy was start with text. The second strategy is make some alternatives. This is the one that students go hallelujah, hooray, and they raise their fists and yell. So get ready to raise your fists and yell. Strategy three is let people do it their way. I'm going to uh, d describe what's on the screen on the three parts here. On the left-hand side, there's a traditional essay. In the middle, there's an indication of a number of audio files on a computer. And over on the right-hand side, uh, there's a student with a microphone, and she's speaking into the microphone. And there's equal signs among all of these things. Let me actually read the title, if I can see it, of this paper. The effect of chocolate and cocoa flavonoids on plasma lipids and lipoproteins associated with cardiovascular disease. Right? Anybody tell me what that is in plain English, by the way? Someone said chocolate will kill you, but it's actually the opposite. A little chocolate is really good for you. So we have some cake in the back for afterwards, and so uh, we'd love to, love to point you in that direction. But what this slide actually gets at, and you students tell your faculty members that you want to do this. If the assignment is to, in this case, write a paper about the effect of good fats in chocolate, then the objectives of that assignment don't actually include being able to use Microsoft Word, right? What the faculty member wants to know is, do you know the effects of good fats in chocolate or other foods? So if the assignment doesn't actually need students to write a paper, then make some choices for students. Think about this, you students. Wouldn't you love it if the professor said, yeah, for this one, you can write the traditional paper, or using the same objectives, you could grab a microphone on your uh, tablet or your, your phone and just speak out what you want to say. Those of you who were here for the last session remember the example of uh, the student who came to TRIO and, and said, you know, I, I have a hard time writing, but I can express myself really well in, in the spoken way. Or take that selfie camera that you keep pointing at yourself and turn it into video and actually report on it like a news reporter. Not only will you students have more choice about how you do that assignment, and you will still be doing it according to the same objectives. You'll be graded the same way no matter which way you choose, but your professor's gonna have more fun grading it too. Let you in on a little secret. Uh, by the time I get to the 29th of the 35 page essays in my class, I'm very glad that they don't let me keep uh, gin and vodka in my desk. <laughs> water, by the way, here. And, and so as a faculty member, I want my students to give me more than one version of something or more than one kind of thing. This reaches out not only to students with disabilities, but also helps students to stay engaged. Wouldn't it be nice if your professor said, yeah, give me any of these, right? Also, here's a little asterisk to this one. If your assignment really does require students to uh, use a particular format. Like if I'm teaching a business English course and one of my assignments is to write a memo in business format, then you doing an audio podcast of your business memo, not gonna work. So choose, you faculty members, which assignments you can give some flexibility on. It doesn't have to be every single one. Try one and see how your students respond. And then come back to me and when we do this event next year, we'll have some more examples that you can share as well. So first strategy was start with text. Second strategy was make some alternatives. Third one was do it their way. And the strategy number four is go step by step. Up here on the screen is a little bit of a visual joke. We have some people dressed like 1940s detectives and they are uh, on seven ladders that are on a stage at various heights. And uh, for those of you who are film buffs, can you name the film that they are parodying? Singing in the Rain, good guess. This is the film noir murder mystery from Alfred Hitchcock. 
the 39 steps. Boo, hiss, right, bad pun, right? But the idea is right, going step by step. Um, how many of you folks have had to sit through watching a 50 minute or 90 minute video from a professor? Oh my God. Okay, all these hands should not go up next year. What's the challenge with a professor putting up simply a recording of one hour worth of a class? Yeah, there's no feedback. It's hard to sit through. I hear a couple of people laughing back here. It's like, oh, he told me to watch it, but I didn't, right? So that's another risk is that there's an awful lot of stuff to cover. The other challenge is if you have students who are on the bus, have only a 3G connection on their phones, that video is not going to buffer or download the whole time that they're watching it anyhow. Here's the other challenge. Students typically study, how long does it take you when you're studying before you check your messages on your phone? How long does it take you when you're studying before you turn on the television? How long when you're studying before you get up and go take a bathroom break or go get a snack or some other thing? People tend to study in bursts of between five and seven minutes. That's what the research tells us. So if you're a professor and you're putting up your one hour uh, lecture video, your students will stop after five or seven minutes. And they may come back, they may come back in the same frame of mind, they may not come back. So being able to chunk things up into their component pieces. And I've had faculty members say, well, what about you know, if I have a real complex topic to cover with my students and I want to give them a way of reviewing that outside of class? I'll say, give them video one, video two, video three, video X out of 10 and ask them to consume those videos as they go through. The other nice thing about that is for the students, if they get stuck someplace, they can watch just that little bit over and over and over again so that they get reinforcement. And for you faculty members, if your content changes, you don't have to re-record the whole hour worth of video. You just re-record that two or three minutes in the chunk. So chunk things up. So the first strategy would start with text. Second strategy was create some alternatives. The third strategy, excuse me, was let them do it their way. Fourth strategy here is chunk things up. The last strategy for universal design for learning is set content free. And when you guys were, were giving suggestions, this one came up a good bit. Set it free in two different ways. First, set it free from the clock. How many of you folks have studied for a test or an exam after midnight? Just about everybody, including the faculty, by the way. Okay, awesome. So what we're seeing is people are taking whatever time they can out of the day to be students. And sometimes that's a few minutes in between dropping kids off and cooking dinner and uh, you know, taking care of your elderly mom or something like that. So universal design for learning allows us to fit in learning where it can happen. Here's another challenge. If you're providing information for your students so that they can consume it outside of class time, how many of you folks who are faculty members share your PowerPoint presentations with your students? Just about all of us. Do you realize that by sharing your PowerPoint presentations with your students, it means that students have to have PowerPoint on the device they're using in order to be able to see it? My phone doesn't get PowerPoint. I could download OpenOffice, but it takes up too much space. I want Angry Birds on here and it would kick it off. So one of the things that we can do to reach out not only to students with disabilities, but all students, and you students demand this from your professors. If your professors give you PowerPoint, ask them to go through that PowerPoint with a screen recording software and post the video up onto YouTube. Everybody's got a video player on their phones. Everybody's got a video player on their mobile devices. The other nice thing about YouTube is if you upload a video to YouTube, YouTube now has a little tool in it that says, do you want to caption this video? And you can just go and key along with yourself and put those captions right in for your students. It's a one-stop shop. You no longer need specialized software in order to caption content. Also, I'll put in a plug 
for Doug Lawson and our Students with Disabilities Services office. If you do need a hand with how to do captioning, you can contact his office. There's Kimberly Shodick in the back with the Faculty Multimedia Learning Resource Center. They can help. We can help at the Center for Teaching and Learning. There's no excuse if you're putting up video content not to have it captioned for students. By the way, who are the students who use the captioning feature? I put the captions on when I watch movies at home. Especially because I like those dark British comedies where they're talking in Cockney accent and I can't understand it at all, so I just turn that on so I can see along too. Your student who's going home on the bus, whether he or she has a hearing disability or not, they'll use those captions so that they can follow along quietly and not bother the people sitting around them. So there's a lot of different ways here. And you see what we're talking about we're talking about strategies not only that accommodate students with disabilities, we're talking about strategies that make students with disabilities just students. It doesn't matter what the challenges are, we're designing more broadly, we're designing for a larger swath of people. And by doing that, we make it much less necessary for students like Christofalo's students who came up to her crying, saying, I don't think I'm college material, what should I do? By using universal design for learning, you remember in Dr. Toffolo's example, she allowed students to be able to uh, write out content and she anticipated questions that they might ask so that they didn't have to build up their courage and come talk to her and say, by the way, I need to disclose something that I might not be real comfortable disclosing. And so just thinking ahead like that, that's what universal design for learning is really about. So here are those five universal design for learning strategies. Start new design processes with text. Create alternatives for all of your multimedia. And that doesn't mean create a million alternatives, it just means at least one. Also demonstrate how learners can uh, put together their course objectives. And this is a great way for us to re-examine as faculty members, what do we want our students to be able to do? Those of you who are taking pictures of the screen, this is available on our website. So uh, you will have access to this after the, the whole presentation. Although keep taking pictures, I really like it. I'll, I'll pose like this. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, the next one, break up complex learner tasks into separate components. In other words, chunk up your material so that students can gain access to it in three minute or five minute or seven minute chunks. And that's going to make sure that when the next uh, all about that base video comes into their inbox, they can go look at it and then come back. And expand, document, and share the interactions within your online instruments using free or low cost tools. I actually want to back up here. Take a look. All of these tools on the screen, like Audacity, Jing, VoiceThread, Screencast-O-Matic, and Screener, these are all free tools. You faculty can use them, and you students can use them to create content for your courses. Some of them have limitations, like Jing will allow you to record the screen for up to five minutes, but Screencast-O-Matic has no time limit on it at all. And so there's a number of tools that you can use in order to make your life easier as you are becoming a universal design for learning teacher or a universal design for learning student or a universal design for learning staff support member. So let's check in with our friend Reed. Remember, uh, fedora, cigarettes, lipstick, murder, bags of money, dim lit, dimly lit bars, right? Okay, we're back in that mindset. So how might Reed apply some of these universal design principles to his course on 1940s hard-boiled detective fiction. Think for a minute. If you have a, a response, I'd love to, love to share it with you folks. Now that you know some of these strategies, help read teach. Got a comment up front here. Charlotte? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to give anything away or give a complicated answer, but I think that if he could do that by following some of the principles that you laid forth just recently about taking a picture of the, the different things, so to start with the text, to break up things into chunks, and to order you know, alternative formats such as video, I think he can use that. I'm not really sure if I understand your question, though. Can you think of one thing that the professor could do in order to 
help teach 1940s detective fiction better? What could that do? Give one example. Well, if he could do the subtitling for some of these things for some of the videos. I mean, if there are videos. Awesome. And one of the things, we have some librarians in the house, and they're going to nod vigorously when I say this. So we have a database for, from the library of lots of different educational films, and we have a feature film collection in the library. All of those films are already captioned, already subtitled. There's already a text version of them. You faculty members, this is Kimberly Shodick. She's one of our librarians. Any other library folks in the house? Oh, man, you're representing today, Kimberly. Very nice. Uh, but definitely get in touch with our library folks because a lot of the work has already been done for faculty members so that they can provide already captioned content like movies like The Thin Man and The Maltese Falcon. And I'm uh, thinking of you know, other movies from the, from the era. So excellent suggestion. So you said that there was one, there's a database within the university here, or are you talking about we're connected with a network of databases? What do you mean? It's one of the library databases uh, that the library has already licensed. So as students and faculty, you already have access to all of these. Definitely talk with the librarians. Fantastic. Thank you. How else could Reed work in a detective fiction class? I see people pointing at other people, but OK, here's a hand up. Awesome. Thank you. I would think um, I teach theater and communication. So one of the things I would suggest he do is a small group of students dramatize something from one of the stories or the comic books. He films it, captions it, posts it. Then the other students can enjoy some of, of the story that way because maybe they're not readers, but they can understand what's happening in the text when it's brought to life. And this is one of the sneakiest possible things to do as a faculty member. Thank you very much for suggesting it. And that is to ask your students to create materials and content, and then ask them after the course is over with if you could use it for future classes. This is the way, I'm, you students can laugh, but this is the way that professors build up libraries of material for others to use. And you students are the best people to share that material because you give your own understanding of it. Would you rather watch the professor telling you how to do the exam or rather watch people who took the exam last semester tell you how to do the exam? Same idea. So awesome. Other suggestions? One thing that I use is OneNote. I don't know if people are familiar with it. Um, one of the um, capabilities of the program is it allows people to say, if I wanted to tape this whole um, thing today, I can tape it with my phone and it goes into my like notebook in the cloud. And my teacher has access to it. Other peers that I share the notebook with would have access to it. And um, my teacher would have the capabilities of telling me if I'm on track with a particular thing or note that I wrote. Um, it's just a, a good um, program for um, sharing materials and um, storing them and organizing them. Awesome. And that's. Yes. We pay for it already, so it's free. <laughs> Yay. All right. Awesome. So. In the, yeah, to say more about it, please. It's called OneNote. Yes, OneNote. Yes, it's, it's part of Microsoft um, um, Office. Awesome. And these are the folks in the Trio office here. So cool deal. Another suggestion here in the back. I think in this case, the professor could have each student read a chapter of the book and report back. Um, as a crime reporter would and break it down and then report back to the class what came out of that chapter as a crime reporter would. Oh, awesome. So the idea of asking students to play roles and giving them various ways to do those roles. This is actually uh, goes back to that very first universal design principle of keeping learners engaged. One of the things that professors can sometimes skimp on is just the, the little housekeeping kinds of things. How are you doing? Where should you be now? What should you be doing in the next, uh, next day or week or what have you? And those are the ways that you can keep students engaged. If it, makes, it makes the learning more interesting. So I love the idea of asking people to do some reports. There are some other hands here. Hi. 
Um, some of the classes I took, um, they'll actually do a movie to literature comparison, or actually have a re they'll have a movie to literature comparison, mm -hmm. and a and the teachers will identify like, are these common themes represented in literature, or are these just new modern spinoff uh, knockoffs? Because when I took a Shakespeare class, um, we were like looking for different forms like hubris and taking action within Hamlet. So they showed, she showed like three different clips of two modern versions of Hamlet and the reenactment, uh, the actual precise reenactment. And uh, we actually compared those motifs, those themes within the actual literature. Fantastic, and, and asking your students, this is a, an awesome assignment, whoever your professor is, we, I love this, um, asking students to look at various versions of things, read the text, see a movie interpretation, and then work from there to build your own theory, your own idea, your own understanding. So excellent example. Also, it, re it makes me think of Kenneth Branagh in his Hamlet, where we actually do get to see his butt. So, <laughs> I know, I know. I, other ideas? I think sometimes if you can combine some of this with like really small on-campus service learning projects. So um, in my human rights class last year, um, I taught about the right to food and then I had the students make a PowerPoint. Um, and the next step I have to do now is to take that, their best slides, and turn them into posters that we can post in the garden so that we're educating the community about what the right to food. So um, I have to close that circle, but um, it, I, it was like, it was no, students got no points for this and they put more time into that than almost any other assignment in the course because they knew it was going into the community. So awesome. um, that little, just a little tiny, little micro service learning project can be very helpful. Fantastic, and that's, that actually goes back to that first principle of learner engagement and uh, the informal way to talk about this is called the university of get their butts out of their seats. And the less that we can make learning happen while we are sitting down, and the more we can make learning happen while we are creating, doing, out in the world, looking, asking, creating, that's going to stick with students much better. And it's going to reach out to students across the spectrum of ability, gender, race, anything like that, and allow us to bring our own personalities, our own skills to all of the assignments that our professors are asking us to do. Excellent conversation. Let me hang this up for a second and let me, let me wrap up with you folks today. Here are some takeaways for you folks. One of them is the Center for Applied Special Technology, which is CAST, C-A-S-T. And they have some guidelines for how can you incorporate universal design for learning into your teaching. And uh, this web address is on the handout that you see on some of your seats here. All of the, all of the resources that I'm going to mention are actually on this handout. If you don't see it on a seat near you, you didn't sit up front, so come on down and grab them after the session is over with. Uh, also, I want to mention that uh, for our own folks, one of the other handouts here, uh, my colleague Kenny Beyer and I, we were doing some brainstorming about how could we get universal design for learning to be adopted across campus at NEIU. And I told him about the three different ways of universal design for learning. Multiple ways of representing information, multiple ways of students demonstrating their skills, multiple ways to keep students engaged. And he said, yeah, you could do it like a Chinese menu, you know, one from column A and one from column B. And, and I said, yeah, like a Chinese menu. So what we created was we created a, a Chinese menu of universal design for learning strategies. We have a bunch of strategies here. Actually, the hardest part of this for me was finding the little font piece that is the chili icon for the spicy ones. So if you have an opportunity, grab one of those handouts as well. I also want to let you folks know that we are in good company in adopting universal design for learning as just the way we do business at the university. You'll see Boston College, Northern Colorado, University of Vermont, uh, the Carnegie Mellon University, San Francisco State. We've got a lot of good company in, in institutions who have adopted UDL as just this is how we do it. And this is a state that we want to move toward. Uh, I'll let you folks know up here in the top corner of this slide, it's got the, uh, 
the slide has the UDL community like College Star, and uh, it's a consortium of community colleges in the south, all those universities that I mentioned before. Up here in the top right hand corner, and this is on your handout too, is a web address called udloncourse.cast.org. And that is CAST's website. They just uh, put it online, made it go live over this summer. And it is their website for using universal design for learning and higher education. For those of you who came in after, you got, uh, after the secret was announced, I'll announce the secret again here. You see an uh, evaluation form on the seats and around you. If you don't, uh, grab one of those because it has a little tear-off portion where you can write your name and get in the drawing at the end of our time together for this book, which is just published a month ago, Universal Design for Learning Theory and Practice. It is the latest book from the Center for Applied Special Technology. So if you want, uh, I'll be coming around in a couple of seconds here with the special professional conference bucket, and uh, you can put your name in there, and we'll have the drawing at the end. So here's the last part of our thought exercise. What challenges or solutions or questions do you still have? We couldn't cover everything in an hour and 10 minutes together. So what are you still thinking about or how are you going to use what you've learned today? What are you going to ask you students? What are you going to ask your professors for? You faculty members, what are you going to go back to your office and do in the next couple of days? I see a lot of benefits to this. What I'm concerned, what one of, one of my challenges would be is academic writing because we come from different um, areas of the city that have different, um, the, that people come with in different areas and they come to the table with different skills. And how do we measure those skills and make sure that those writing skills and academic skills are up to are when we're looking at videos and not written work and things of that nature. Because in when we're going on into master's programs, we're expected to have that kind of capability. Two, two ways to answer that question, and I hope they're both useful for you. One of them is if the skill you are teaching is writing, have students write. Okay. Uh, you know, don't don't tell them to create a video if what you really want is written product. Now. If it's uh, easier for a student uh, with motor disabilities to use something like dictation software or work with a classmate so that that person speaks it out and the other person types it, uh, you can put together assignments so that it doesn't mean that you have to have motor skills in order to be able to express yourself in the written word. One way to answer that. Another way to answer that is go ahead and give your students variety but only on one of your assignments. You know, an early assignment in the class could be write it out or give me the video. And then the next assignment could be flip that around and make it into a more polished written format. You know, have the draft be a video, do some video note taking, if you will. And then the final product has to be a Microsoft Word document if what you're teaching is business writing or academic writing skills. So there's ways that you can approach it so that you still get your objectives and your students have a more open experience of it, and you funnel them through to the objectives rather than saying, here's the line that you have to walk down from assignment to assignment to assignment. Does that help? Yeah, so you're, you're talking about like varying and implementing those skills into certain assignments, but also having the availability of other assignments yeah. to do something different. Yeah. That's what I love about universal design for learning is that it, it doesn't have to be absolutely every single thing you do in your class. Chris, you wanted to respond? One of the things that I used successfully last semester was um, every, you know, when people had to hand in a piece of writing to me, they had to hand it in to another student first who had to use the track changes function in Word to correct it. So I was teaching them how to use track changes so they could use, because that's an increasingly a job skill that's necessary. And um, one, students write better for each other than they do for us. And two, I was reading really polished drafts, so I wasn't as annoyed, and students got better grades. So, I mean, it was, it was a way of teaching students how to then edit, I think, as well. So I was teaching them officially a job skill, 
but I was also teaching him to edit. And if you're a better editor, you're going to be a better writer. So that was just one way of teaching writing in a, you know, just a slightly more inter, inter, in, interesting way or, or varied way. All right, fantastic. And yeah, the, the comment was using peer influence as a, a good strategy as well. There's another comment down here. And there are um, add-on programs for Word, and it's one for Max that's already on there. And it reads back the paper to students so they actually hear their um, grammatical errors. It helps me out. Yeah, it helps me out because I, like, I have ADHD, and sometimes I correct my mistakes, and I don't see them. So when I hear it, I see the mistakes. And so it's one way like technology has just moved forth to help us. And so both are free and they are available on Word for Apples and Macs. Fantastic. Good resource questions here. Yeah, I got I got awesome. Comment back here. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Yeah. So just adding to that, just the importance of uh, having just different learning styles in a class. So accommodating for those learning styles. So how is a visual learner going to learn how to write? They probably need to see an example of it to do it. Or an auditory learner needs to hear it and hear the words. So like Richie shared, hearing what they're saying and, and that type of thing. So versus a kinesthetic learner who can just maybe do it. So just making sure that you're using a creative way of accommodating just different learning styles. Awesome. And uh, we talk about learning styles. We talk about universal design for learning. My hope is that you're recognizing that this is a way to think about your approach. I probably haven't said much that's brand new to you here, but it's a way to put it all into one bucket in your mind so that you can approach it consistently as you work through your course design or if you're a student as you're moving through the course and telling your professor, hey, I wish I had this or that or the other. And learning styles is another way to think about that. Awesome. Other comments, questions? This is your time, folks. Yeah. Um, well, I'm studying to be a teacher right now, and one of the things that I find students, <laughs> I find students and myself have a lot of trouble with is never having really clear instructions. So teachers say, we want you to write a paper on this, but then they won't include a rubric or what they want us to do um, in terms of the style of the paper, whether it's an analysis or a review or X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. And that's really bad, especially for ESL learners who may not even, may have trouble understanding the instructions as they see them. So yeah. including as clear instructions as possible. Yeah, including clear instructions. So I've, I've been this professor. And I, I'll confess something that I'm a little ashamed of. I've been the professor who, when I first started teaching, I gave real general instructions on everything, thinking my students should be professionals. My students have made it into college. They should know what they're talking about and how to do it. Uh -uh. What I've learned is I need to be clear and explicit in what I'm asking my students to do. There's two sides to that coin of expectations. We faculty members are typically really good at setting expectations for you students. You have to attend this many classes, you have to write this many papers, they have to be this long, they have to be an APA, you have to use English properly, you have to form, format it with one inch margins all the way around, you have to be double spaced, it's gotta be Times New Roman 12, I mean we can get really picky, right? But the other side of that coin, and part of universal design, is that we faculty members also communicate our expectations for our own behaviors in the class. We tell you, when's the best time to get a hold of me by email or phone? We tell you, how, is it, uh, how many days should you expect to pass between the time something is due and the time I get it back to you? And this is for face-to-face, -face, blended or online classes. Again, this has nothing to do with people with disabilities. This has to do with setting those expectations. And you faculty members, try this out and watch how you don't get the 700 emails from your students saying, I'm confused about when is this due, what do I do, all those things. So setting clear expectations, giving clear directions. Awesome. What other things are there to, to bring up here? Challenges, questions? In the back here, Renee. Thanks. Yes. As a tutor here in the psych department, I find that um, my instructional uh, capability and capacity is kind of a fast food 
you know, speedy lane. I don't get necessarily 16 weeks of planning with my students. I don't necessarily get more than 20 minutes with them. But I have to solve a lot of problems quickly and I have to quickly assess whether or not this person can read well, this person can write well, um, this person is understanding content, this, you know, um, do you have do you have any suggestions as how to streamline this for those of us who are in that interim? We're not we're students and we're teachers at the same time. Those of us who do this tutoring gig. And I can actually bring this back a little bit to the theme for our day, which is supporting people with disabilities. One of the things that you heard in some of our previous presentations today was don't treat people with disabilities differently from how you would treat other people. Don't make them special. In Wilfredo's uh, in session, he talked about the idea of feeling that you're part of a special population. Uh, for those of you who are tutors or people who are helping students or even you people uh, who are going to do uh, peer review with each other in your courses where you're working for a short period of time with people whom you might not know all that well, um, one of the things is to go back to setting of expectations, asking up front, what do you want to accomplish? And then a second really powerful question to ask is, how can I help you do that? That's a way of asking, is there anything I need to know about you, how you learn, what you want to do that you need to tell me so that we can be successful in the interaction we're having? A lot of people ask that in lots of different ways. So how can I help you do what you want? And then a last piece on that is double checking to make sure you're done. And uh, for those of you who are students, if you're doing peer review, if you're working on a, an assignment, how do you know when you're done? It's the deadline and you've turned in the assignment. If you're working with a colleague, how do you know when you're done? Well, you might think, oh, okay, the student came in, wanted help with grammar and mechanics. We worked on grammar and mechanics for an hour. Thank you very much. I'll go to the next person. Just asking, did we actually accomplish what you wanted to accomplish today? And if the answer is yes, thank you very much, you smile and you think, boy, I'm doing my job. And if the answer is yes, but I'd like to talk to you about X, or no, there's still this nagging question, that gives you an entree into the next piece that you're going to work on. So bookending with how can I help you with what you want and what do you want to accomplish, setting those clear expectations is going to be a key. And that leads us back into this universal design for learning principle as well. Good question. Well, a couple more minutes, a couple more questions and answers. If you haven't put your, your name in for the drawing for this book, by the way, um, it's, it's a $48 book. So for those of you who are faculty members, um, it's an acceptable gift under the state ethics laws. And for those of you students, this is an awesome thing to have in your arsenal for your own studies as well. Other questions or comments or, or pieces of paper? Awesome, thank you. Ah, one last entry. Is, the, uh, is that book also available on the CAST website? Funny you should mention that, I forgot to. Uh, this, the book that we are raffling off, in print it's 48 bucks. But if you go to cast.org, C-A-S-T dot O-R-G, if you give them your email address and you create a password, you can get the downloadable online version of this book for free. And the downloadable online version of this book also contains multimedia like video examples, like worksheets that you can move through interactively. It's a really nice resource. So I brought you the dumb copy of it and you can go get the smart copy of it for free. So we're definitely gonna raffle this one off in a couple of seconds here, but thank you for the, the plug on that one, I appreciate it. All right, well, that's, oh, all right. there's always one. There's always one. Awesome, thank you. Jeez, all right. Boy, you talk it up and suddenly people want it. Well, Fred, are all of these yours that you're putting in here, by the way? Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, let me, let me close here with saying the need to make change is not always this obvious. There's a photograph on the, on the screen here. Uh, I went to my local Jewel Osco grocery store last winter time, and I noticed that the uh, disabled parking spot 
had the cart return in the disabled parking spot. So I took this picture, I tweeted it to Jewel Osco, I said, not cool. Five minutes later, Jewel Osco Central got back and said, not cool indeed, we're fixing this now. <laughs> so um, I, I want to bring Dr. Christofalo up here as well with me, and we will say thank you very much for being here. We hope it was a good session for you. We appreciate you guys being here. And now, the moment of truth. Uh, me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's shuffling them up. All right, who is it, please? Oh, I don't have my glasses. You're going to oh, okay. read it. <laughs> um, upside down, but I can still read Janine Ntiragesa. <laughs> so congratulations, Dr. Ntiragesa. Here is your book. And we want to say thanks. We have a couple of announcements uh, just to make sure you guys don't go anywhere too, too fast. Uh, there was a little bit of cake in the back here, but uh, at 3 o'clock we're going to have our final session, which is a panel. There will be pizza at the 3 o'clock session, so please come back for that. In the meantime, we'd encourage you to go out those doors and take a left. In the Golden Eagles, there is a photo voice exhibition of art and sculpture from some of our students. We'd love for you to take a look at that. And we also have some community partners like the Department of Labor, the Chicago Park District, all those folks that are out at tables around here. Please visit our sponsors as well. Let me give it back to Doug and thank you again, everybody. We appreciate it.